What's up, everybody? I'm Stan, and welcome to Detail Comics, where we go over comics in detail. This is Shelf Appeal, the weekly show where I go over the comic books that I picked up this Wednesday, give you my impressions as to what they're all about, and whether there's something you should go back to the comic book shop for or not. So make sure you subscribe to get one of these every Wednesday night. The first book that I want to start talking about is Super Sons Number 10. So Super Sons is a title by Peter J. Tomasi, and it deals with primarily Jonathan Kent and Damian Wayne's Robin. So what we get in this one is kind of like after the aftermath of, you know, Planet of the Capes, they've been taking on much larger tasks, and ultimately Superman and Batman recognize this. While we do have a flair for the dramatic in the beginning when uh, we kind of showcase the consistency of John's ability to fly at this point in time, we do realize that there are some limitations that have to be placed on these characters before they go running off into too much danger. At least that's what Batman and Superman feel. So we get the introduction of what eventually becomes the Fortress of Attitude. So this is basically a realignment, giving somebody, you know, giving these characters a base of operations that allows them to kind of move forward and grow as their own individuals, independent of their fathers. So I'm really, I really like that. Uh, you know, I have been off Super Sons for a little while, so I mean, I'm really glad that this is a great place for people to jump onto. If you haven't been reading Super Sons, it's definitely a great place to hop in. And there's going to be a crossover that begins with the next issue called Super Sons of Tomorrow, which is dealing with the Batman of Tomorrow who's coming back to who knows what. <laughs> so I'm really excited about that. Definitely something that you guys should check out if you're interested in Jonathan Kent or Damian Wayne being written in a very specific way. Peter J. Tomasi does a great job with both of those characters, so it's a recommendation from me if you have any interest in them. Of course, the next book that we want to talk about is Justice League number 33. So this finishes off the Bats Out of Hell storyline, which is really dealing with the Dark Knights versus the Justice League members. So when we last left off in Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern Corps number 32, everybody from the Justice League was essentially enslaved and brought to the Anti-Monitor's Tuning Fork, where we see the members of the Suicide Squad, as well as the Teen Titans, still lashed to the Anti-Monitor's Tuning Fork. And what we get is not necessarily a story that concludes that in so many ways. Instead, we realize that this entire storyline was all about Cyborg, which really should have been a clear indication from the first get-go. So what I'm really excited about is that this opens up the possibilities of the Mother Boxes and really kind of delves a little bit deeper into them. I really want to kind of dive deep into what this storyline means for Cyborg, but overall I think that it's a very fitting conclusion for the storyline, and it really gives Cyborg some development. I mean, it's the most interested I've been in the Cyborg character, well, pretty much ever. Uh, so that is a phenomenal achievement for this storyline, and overall I find that it's mostly satisfying way to kind of get us into the Dark Knights, get us out of the Dark Knights, and get us back on track for Metal Number 4, as well as the Wild Hunt, which is alluded to in this issue as well. So it's definitely something that you're going to need to pick up if you want to complete everything, and it's something that you could actually kind of pick up as a standalone to get a much better idea of exactly what's going on and what kind of development Cyborg will be having as a character. So uh, that's a pretty soft recommendation for me, something that you've got to check out if it's something you feel like you're interested in it. Of course, one of the mainstays of my pull list, just because I'm a Spider-Man fan, is Amazing Spider-Man. So 791 finishes off the fall of Parker's storyline with part number three. So we see Peter kind of getting in tune with his superhero-ness. He's got his first day on the job where he's dealing with the pressures of the Daily Bugle and Robbie Robertson. His whole identity is being a failed billionaire, you know, conglomerate manager into somebody that might have had a pity hire at his former paper. So there's a lot of different things that are really wearing Peter Parker down, but we get to see some progression of Peter Parker into a place where he's moving past those kind of things. And it's great to see the interaction that he has with Mockingbird because it's very much a, hey, tiger, <laughs> you know, get it back in gear. You gotta, you gotta be a better person than this. You know, I, this is only so cute for so long. There is a bit of witty banter. There's a little bit of Dan Slott kind of like, you know, taking a shot at himself when it comes to the hyphen uh, for the naming scheme between the new superhero pairing, you know, Mockingbird and Spider-Man. So it's Mockingman, I think that's what it is, you know, with a hyphen and she's, you know, she calls that out. But ultimately we get a release of a, of a villain that we're going to probably have to pay some consequences for a little bit later on in the storyline. And then ultimately I found that it was a really fun introduction that brought the character back to basics without doing a lot of regression. So, you know, you didn't feel like this was just, you know, kicking him back to the status quo for the sake of kicking him back to the status quo. If this happened, it seems like a very plausible and natural development, and for the first time in a long time, I'm really excited for where Amazing Spider-Man is going to be going. Not everybody's going to agree with me on that sentiment, but I am a much more forgiving person when it comes to Spider-Man titles due to my deep love of Spider-Man. So it's just one of those things where if you're looking for a place to get back into Amazing, 789, 797, 91. That was a great intro. The Venom, Inc., Alpha, Omega, and the crossover between those two books is going to be happening over the course of the next month or two. So might not be the best place to jump in for that if you're interested in a Spider-Man Venom crossover to see what happens with, you know, 
uh, you know, Peter Parker and the symbiote. We'll see what happens with Eddie Brock, who now possesses the symbiote. And of course, Flash Thompson, who used to possess the symbiote. This is going to be a very interesting place for you to jump onto. Take all those things into consideration when you're checking out the comic book rack next month. Next, let's dive into the realm number three, which is going to continue the story of some very intrepid adventurers that are currently caught in a bit of a bind. So last issue, they were rescued from this individual uh, you know, calamity that was being caused, this giant monstrosity and these goblins and things that are kind of chasing them into this underground tunnel system. And they're saved by this person of unknown origin and they, they lead him to, to safety. And there's a whole bunch of different interplay that goes along with this. There is this kind of final, this conflict. Finally, this unknown man who's been just decimating and destroying orcs and goblins all across the wasteland has, you know, kind of made it to the point where he's almost at the same level, almost at the same position as our main party, so we're probably going to be introduced to him a lot sooner rather than later, which I really like. We have the introduction of possible, like, more modern militaristic versions of characters. You know, you've got a sniper unit for the goblins. You've got this uh, very interesting interaction between, you know, Redjaw, his female compatriot, and, uh, you know, the, the lich. So there's a lot of different interplay that's kind of coming along here. You really need to be reading one and two in order to get make any sense out of number three. So it's probably got enough time to go back and catch one and two. It's definitely something that I'm going to be in at least through the remainder of the first story arc. It's, it's just got me on that, but because it's mixing some of my favorite things. So it might not necessarily be for everybody, but it's one that I'm enjoying and that I kind of want to see where it goes more of. So your mileage may vary on that one. Take that advice as you will. Now we get to deal with the aftermath of one of the most recent reveals in comics, and that is Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man number 297, which picks up after Peter reveals his secret identity to his longtime foe, J. Jonah Jameson slash stepbrother. So it's definitely a really interesting title, and one of the cool things is that we get to see Peter Parker not being Spider-Man, being Spider-Man at the same time as he battles his way out of his own apartment building. So there's a lot of different contingency plans, and ultimately brute strength wins out for a man that's got such a big brain, which is kind of ridiculous, but it's definitely fitting in the situation because he's without a lot of his resources and tools that he has in the form of Spider-Man. However, he does have one thing that really matters, and that's his strength and his superhuman durability. So he just goes to town and wrecks all the floors, you know, diving his way into the basement. We have this really odd kind of combination of costumes where you've got black costume, red face mask, you know, red, red hands, and he doesn't have any web shooters, and he's just vaulting and leaping around as he needs to using his physical prowess. And then finally, we have a situation where there's a man that's going to be whooping his ass using some enhanced technology. And we get the idea that, of course, the Black Widow ploy that was at the beginning of this entire series has paid off and given a tactical advantage to these people that are trying to hunt down both Peter and his sister. But the most important thing is the, the help that comes and the outcome at the end of the issue. It's very good. I'm really happy with the way Chip Zdarsky is writing this, so I don't want to ruin it for you guys. But it's definitely something that I would recommend checking out, especially if you're a Spider-Man fan. It gives you a totally different take than what you get out of Amazing Spider-Man and Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows, which is always welcome. Then we'll jump into Image, and then we've got Descender, Rise of the Robots, number 26. And what this does is it basically starts the end of humanity. At least that's what Jeff Lemire and Dustin Nguyen want us to believe because as we kind of get to the climactic moment of this final arc, the rise of the robots, we finally see the robots rise. And then there's so much stuff that has to go on. It's really a situation where I can just tell you, I can just be the best proponent. I can, I can be preaching the, the good nature of this particular book to everybody until the cows come home, but I can't tell you much about it because I don't want to ruin it. I'd rather have you read it because it's just, it's good. It's got a great art style. It's got a great storyline told by Jeff Lemire. It's definitely one of my biggest recommendations from independent comics. So I highly recommend that you guys go out and grab Descender, whether it's 26 or the first trade or anything like that. You're going to be pretty pleased with the storyline, at least I am. And that's, I can't recommend it enough to people. It's just great. While we're still on independent titles, let's talk about Bloodshot Salvation number three. So Bloodshot finally meets Daddy. And then ultimately the magic, the you know, mysterious kind of corporate entity that's taken possession of all this very na various technology and these remnants of these various programs that are throughout the Valiant universe has really kind of come home to roost and they've got all these things at their disposal now. And then we get a message through magical means that Bloodshot is now trapped, well, Ray Bloodshot is trapped in 4002 AD, which is kind of crazy, but I think that's setting up for Harbinger Wars number two. And then ultimately he loses the power of his nanites and good God, what's going to happen in Bloodshot Salvation? <laughs> It's just, it's if you're if you're not following along, you have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't, I barely have any idea what I'm talking about. But I am really entertained by everything about this 
story and its concept. So for Valiant to really capture me, not only do I have like a really great time with Exo Manowar, but Bloodshot Salvation is very good, and I'm really enjoying Eternity. That first issue really kind of grabbed me in that respect. So I'm really excited to see where you know Valiant kind of takes me in the future before I you know either cut bait or decide that it's it's something that I'm going to be sticking with for the long haul. So you guys, I definitely recommend that you just check out some Valiant titles to see what might work for you. It's always good to branch out into new things, and I heard really good things about Ninjak Number One that came out this week. So there's a lot of different stuff out there for you to check out. So I highly recommend that you at least give one issue: Exo Man of War Number One, Bloodshot Salvation Number One, Eternity Number One, Divinity Number Zero, any of those kind of things a shot, so that that way you can see if Valiant's right for you or if it's not. But either way, definitely broaden your horizons. Always a recommendation from me. Another book that's always a recommendation is, of course, Superman. So in Superman number 35, we see that we're getting close to the end of the Imperious Lex storyline. So we have the conflict that's taking place between Lex Luthor and Clark Kent Superman on the surface of Apocalypse as, you know, they're trying to outrun these Apocalyptans. Apocalians, ap 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 uh, whatever their name is, you know, where they're trying to run out the uh, outrun the denizens of Apocalypse, who are trying to turn Superman into their god and make him sit on the throne of Darkseid, and Lex Luthor's trying to avoid his fate as a false prophet <laughs> or a false god in front of them, as well as the, you know, culmination of kind of this conflict. We finally have all the keys of the family. There's a great little story arc for John, where his humanitarian nature kind of comes back to, to really aid him in the end, and then there's this final splash page that's leading into a conflict between the female Furies, you know, the, the, the Hellhounds, the Bloodhounds, whatever it is, and then ultimately Superman, and, and there's just so much going on in this big battle that I can't wait to see the Super Family unite and what it means for the future of Apocalypse. So, highly recommend Superman just in general. It's just been a great book ever since Peter J. Tomasi started writing it at the beginning of DC Rebirth, so I can't help but recommend it every time that I pick it up. As we're on the doorstep of Superman's potential rule over Apocalypse, we're actually at the end of the Death of Mighty Thor storyline, or at least the end of Jane Foster's Thor. That's what we seem to be imp you know, implying anyway, but in Mighty Thor number 701, a lot of stuff happens that you either expected or you didn't really expect. So what we really get is a lot of backstory but about the Mangog. So I really want to kind of dive deeper into the Mangog and something totally different because he's got a very unique origin and his power set's very unique, so it's very interesting as far as that's concerned. But what we get is that we get uh, this brash conflict between you know, the War Thor, you know, Volstagg, con you know, converted with the ultimate Thor's Mjolnir from this dead ultimate universe versus the Mangog, who's powered by a billion, billion, you know, souls and, you know, their fury over the course of this universe. And then it's just this back and forth of this brutal kind of nature. And then ultimately the, the ending is inevitable. Uh, it's, it's just one of those things where I'm really excited to see where Jason Aaron's going because he's ratcheting up this kind of tension. We get to reunite, uh, you know, we get to reunite uh, Carnilla, the Queen of the Norns, with Baldur the Brave, who is now the King of the Undead inside Hell. There's some very interesting concepts on that, and the War of the Realms is starting to intrude into all realms at this point in time. So what we're going to have to see is we're going to have to see a bit more, you know, Jane Foster, Thor. We're going to have to see a lot more Loki. We're going to have to see a lot more Odin. There's going to be some serious conflicts that happen, and ultimately there's going to be some people that aren't necessarily on the battlefield anymore for various reasons. I'm going to do a full review on Mighty Thor number 701, so definitely take a look at that so that that way you can get a little bit more in-depth kind of detail on that particular book and what it means going forward. Another book I'm probably going to do a full review on is Doctor Strange number 381. So Doctor Strange number 381 is more about Loki. <laughs> so going from a Thor book to a Doctor Strange book, you'd expect it to be less Asgardy. However, Loki has now taken over the role of Sorcerer Supreme from Doctor Strange as part of some tournament as insinuated by Doctor Strange. So it's just one of those really interesting things, and we get to see what Loki does with the power of the Sorcerer Supreme. It's really interesting because the first thing that he does is he starts bragging <laughs> in a way that a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate because there's always a price for magic. However, as Loki kind of touts his Asgardian constitution, his ability to kind of take on these tasks and things like that, we also get a few more unsettling things. Loki is a, is a god of mischief, a god of lies, and ultimately his deceptions are... They're, they're not necessarily obvious in the way that Donny Cates writes him. I mean, G.H. Walt's art on it is pretty fantastic, but the way that Donny Cates write this, writes this character and writes the use of magic, writes how Loki is utilizing these things throughout the Marvel Universe is very interesting. So that's why I want to really dive deep into it. Is it Jason Aaron's run on Doctor Strange? 
I don't know. It's only the first issue. But I do know that G.H. Walt is going to do a fantastic job on the art. There's very much a similar style to, to Chris Bocciolo, and he's carrying over a lot of that, but using his own unique flair. So there's a lot of consistency when it comes to the art itself, even though it's a very distinct art style. And the writing is definitely very different, but it feels interesting at the same time. So highly recommended for me. If you are a fan of Doctor Strange, you want to get in on something new, Doctor Strange number 381 and moving forward is definitely a recommendation for me. Really Really enjoyed it and I'm really excited to see where it goes. Another book that I'm really excited to see where it goes is War Machine. Well, Punisher. Punisher 218! <laughs> so, you know, this is the, the lenticular cover of that which shows the original cover of Iron Man when War Machine was introduced and then of course this one that's got a completely different take on Frank Castle. You can definitely see the influence of the Netflix series on the actual character design of Frank Castle. He definitely looks a little bit more like John Barenthal, but the real interesting concept here that Matthew Rosenberg's really pushing for isn't necessarily that Frank Castle is, you know, the, he is always viewed in a very different lens, but depending on who you are as a person, who and where your kind of moral center is, what time period he's really participating in. Because if you think about it, you know, in a lot of cases he's portrayed as a villain, you know, or essentially an anti-hero, or sometimes he is a hero, depending on the context and what's necessary for that particular time. So he's a man that's not necessarily, he is a, a tool, so he is not necessarily somebody that's bound by this moral code other than some very loose regulations. And, you know, it's just one of those things where if you give this, this man that, you know, has one strict, distinct purpose the tools that he needs to affect change on a much larger scale to take on much larger tasks. It's really meant to, to draw a much larger comparison to various things while remaining true to Frank Castle. So I'm really excited about War Machine, well, about Punisher number 218 in the War Machine armor. So I think I'm gonna do a full review on that one too, so that that way I can at least figure out and, and dissect and, and dive deep into what it really means for the character moving forward. I think that he pays a lot of homage to the original concept of Frank Castle while taking it in a pretty interesting direction. And I'm a big fan of Matt Rosenberg in general, so I'm excited to see where it goes. As we get down to the end of my poll for this week, we've got to talk about Batman number 35, which continues and finishes the Rules of Engagement storyline, which deals with the confrontation between Catwoman and Talia al Ghul. So this one is really more about the backstory of the ladies that Bruce Wayne loves or that love Bruce Wayne, you know, that love Batman, and what their motivations are. Because you know, what we come down to is that, you know, Talia is born out of absolute pain and horror. You know, being raised as the daughter of the demon, she has been, a, she has had to put up with so much stuff that has just turned her into the person that she is. Where Selena Kyle didn't really have anything, she became the person that she is as part of the natural evolution of her around her. But, you know, she comes from nothing and she feels, you know, Talia looks at this as a sense of, of worthiness, as her position as the daughter of the demon and then, you know, the next the next demon, is, uh, so to speak, you know, she's looking for a parallel, an equal. You know, the detective is the only person that really could be her equal or might potentially be. Whereas Catwoman doesn't even look at him as an equal. She looks at him as a broken man at every level who will always kind of, you know, default to this promise that he made as a 10-year-old boy in an alleyway, stricken with the grief of the loss of his parents. And she just, he's a stupid man that she is stupidly in love with. And it's, it's, I don't necessarily know if the fight goes exactly the way that I would have thought it would be, but I appreciate that, you know, the power of Catwoman and her versatility kind of takes out Talia, who's probably doesn't have like her entire heart in the killing of these characters, because she might not be so emotionally tied to those kind of things. But I do like the end where she's talking to Holly Robinson and she's asking Holly as a friend to do this for her so that that way she can be with a man that she loves while Talia is just like, so this is the woman that you're, you're going to be married to. And it's like, yeah. Well, I like her. <laughs> so when Talia likes Catwoman and, you know, X is talking, that kind of thing, it's a really interesting kind of concept. But the real key comes to the relationship between Dick Grayson and Damian Wayne. And I'm really excited about where that goes. It just kind of cements them as brothers, you know, unofficially and, you know, potentially officially. You never really know as to how these things go. But the the relationship with them is, is deepened and it's a lot more understanding in that respect. And the idea that, you know, Batman gives so much that he hesitates to ask because it means taking something. So it's, it's a really cool concept. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to do a full review on this one, but it's definitely something that I'm considering. So take a look at the channel to make sure to see what comes up. You'll probably get an announcement if you got one of those alarm bell things kind of clicked on for the video. But the big book that I really want to talk about is The Batman Who Laughs. So The Batman Who Laughs is... 
Well, it's the, it's the end, really. It's the end of the introductions of these Dark Knight's characters. So this is the, the puppeteer below Barbatos. He is the lieutenant. He's the general to, the, to you know, the, the, the king, the president, you know, the man that's up at the top making the decisions, and this is the person putting those plans into motion, giving the orders to the soldiers. And the story behind him is interesting, because if you're talking about this, it's, he's in Earth-22, and in Earth-22, as far as the multiversity storyline is concerned, it's the Kingdom Come universe. And in the Kingdom Come universe, uh, you know, Magog, uh, he's the one that ends up killing the Joker. Uh, you know, the, the, it's just, it, it, it's totally different. It kind of flips everything on its heel. The look of the, the characters is completely different. And the setup of this, this joke that goes too far is something that's, you know, it's it's sadistically methodical so when you combine this kind of sadistic nature this ability to laugh off the restraints of what would hold you back and kind of embrace this madness this chaos that allows you to kind of take your plans to the fullest nature is interesting that's for sure so i'm sure scott snyder gave some notes but james tynan really kind of put together uh, a really interesting plot that always feels like the the batman who laughs is just breaking the fourth wall consistently because he's talking to this masked kind of targeted man that we have still have no idea who this particular person is or what their involvement is in the overall plot, which is kind of interesting on its own right. But it's definitely something that I want to dive a little bit more deeper into, so I'm going to do a full review on Batman Who Laughs to see exactly what's going on and try to figure out exactly where we're going with this because it's going to be absolutely crazy. So uh, that's what I picked up for this week, but I want to know what you guys grabbed too, so hit me up in the comments down below and we can start that conversation. As always, if you like what you see, hit the like button, and don't forget to subscribe to get more news, reviews, and commentary on comic books, comic book movies, comic book TV shows and games, and anything and everything inside the world of comics.